every year in the springtime, Jews observe Passover. It is the celebration of the day Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. On today's Jewish Passover table, there are four cups observed. These cups have meanings, prophetic meanings, some of which are yet to be fulfilled. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me the four cups of Passover. And those of you who have been with us a while, remember that <clears throat> we noted that the Gospel of John is outlined around four Passovers, and each one of those Passovers corresponds to one of the cups, which is uh, consumed <clears throat> during the Passover Seder, or Passover meal. Passover then becomes a a structure, an outline, even a prophecy. The Jews think of their Passover in very important terms. I'm reading from a Passover Haggadah here called uh, <clears throat> Feasting for Freedom or From Bondage to Freedom. And that's the theme of Passover. <clears throat> and I'm reading here and I quote, The liberation from Egypt was not merely a nationalistic incident but the creation of a nation with a universal mission. J.R., the Jews really believe that Passover is something bigger than life, if you will. Not merely a historical event, but something with, with huge universal implications having to do with coming of Messiah. And even though the first one took place 34, 3500 years ago, we don't know exactly the date, but uh, it still has significance to this very day. And prophecies that will be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. In Exodus chapter 6, there are two verses of Scripture from which the Jewish people draw the meanings of the four cups. There is the first cup of sanctification, the second cup of thanksgiving, the third cup of redemption, and the fourth cup of completion. And they take them from these two verses. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, Exodus 6, 6, I am the Lord and I will bring you out, that's sanctification, from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will rid you out, that's uh, the uh, thanksgiving cup, mm -hmm. out of their bondage and I will redeem you, that's the cup of redemption, with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, Number four, and I will take you to me. That's completion. Take you mm. to me for a people. Now, from these four cups and from these two verses comes a fascinating prophetic scenario. The outline that we see in the four cups <clears throat> reminds us of the number four, J.R. I should interject at this time briefly that the number four is the kingdom number. It begins as the number of the material creation. The fourth day the land is created. <clears throat> we have the four points of the compass and the four seasons of the year and the four phases of the moon and, and on and on and on. Uh, the material creation is seen in the Bible in the number four. The four cups therefore refer to the creation and when, when you take the Passover, Cup number one, sanctification, begins with a recounting, by the way, of the creation of the earth. Mm. Cup number yes. four at the end uh, is the time when God steps out in plain sight, takes the kingdom, establishes a worldwide kingdom. So mm -hmm. this outline is a universal outline. And this first <coughs> cup with this with the, the theme of the creation mm -hmm. is the reason why John opens his gospel with in the beginning Absolutely. was the word. And all things were made by him. Mm -hmm. So it's a fascinating study. But you know, when we began to look at this Passover, Gary and I realized that this first cup is not the Egyptian exodus. This first cup goes all the way back to Abraham and to the Abrahamic covenant. Fascinating, Gary. This sanctification was when God called Abraham out to the Ur of the Chaldees, mm. a chosen people. And as a matter of fact, the theme of the first cup is, I will bring you out. Well, Abraham was the first man brought out. He was literally brought out from uh, Mesopotamia or Babylon, the cradle of idolatry, and he was led to a land which was to be the promised land, God's land, the location of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And so this process of redemption began in Abraham. The Bible has a philosophy of history. And that philosophy is based, uh, sadly, around the fall of man, his need for redemption. Uh, after the flood, uh, when society redeveloped in the Mesopotamian Valley, 
uh, the process of redemption fell upon the shoulders of Abraham. He was brought out, cup number one, I will bring you out to a land which became the promised land of the Abrahamic covenant. And to further prove that this first cup is the Abrahamic cup, that may I add here was issued by Melchizedek. Yeah, that's when right. Melchizedek brought in the bread and the wine. Backing up to verse 3 of this same chapter, Exodus chapter 6, he says, I appeared unto Abraham. And then in verse 5 he says, I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, Moses, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out. That's cup number one, the cup of sanctification. He's talking about the Abrahamic covenant. This is the covenant he's remembering. This is the covenant that he is adhering to, and he's keeping his promise from that first covenant wherein he sanctified a special people. He chose them. He chose them, and they, beca they became called the Hebrews, referring to coming across the Tigris and the Euphrates into the Promised Land. In chapter 14 of Genesis, came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elsar, Kedarlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, uh, that a war was declared. And essentially, Abraham had to fight a battle in the land. And you know, it's very interesting. The Jews say that, that Tidal, king of nations, was Rome hmm. or representative of Rome. Uh -huh. In other words, Abraham is acting out here in microcosm a battle that would not be fully fought until Armageddon. Armageddon. Amazing. Isn't that amazing? Now, after he brings back uh, Lot and his family and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, then Melchizedek comes out to greet him. That's right. And we have that in uh, <clears throat> Genesis 14, 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, El Elyon. Wow, the first Passover cup. First Passover cup. <laughs> uh, to prove that this is the first Passover cup, uh, at least uh, lends to the um, scenario of these four cups of the Passover. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 41, at the time of the Exodus, this is what the Bible says. It came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day, it came to pass. Ooh. Now they went out of Egypt on Passover. And here he says, 430 years later, there was a fellow named Abraham. And he refers to something that happened on the self same day. Now, though we're not told what exactly happened on that day, we do know there was a cup offered to Abram by Melchizedek. And Jesus Christ is a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So you see, the Melchizedek priesthood was not just a local religion at that time. It was not just an aberration or an afterthought of, or a bump in history. Uh, this Melchizedek priesthood follows on through to this very day. Jesus Christ is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the first Passover cup, the cup of sanctification, took place on a Passover. It did, and at the very same time, <clears throat> God prophesied of the Egyptian bondage, which, by the way, would then bring Moses into center stage. Uh, the events of the very first Passover, that is the freeing of the Egyptians from bondage, uh, or the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage, was actually a fulfillment of the second cup. Mm -hmm. Because the name of the second cup is Thanksgiving, I will rid you of their bondage. Yes. The second cup then, the Exodus that we find in the book of Exodus following, uh, just following the book of Genesis. We have the Jews coming out of Egypt, going into the, the uh, wilderness, mm -hmm. coming to Sinai, and God uh, gives them the Ten Commandments and then the Mosaic Law, the cup of thanksgiving, the Exodus. Fascinating cup. It is fascinating, and the reason uh, that God brought out Israel is because Israel is called in, in Exodus the firstborn of God. Israel is my firstborn son. Mm -hmm. And that son is to be brought to complete maturity. There's a relationship. You know, you, you mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, uh, in fact, I think it was before we actually were on, that, that uh, the covenant of Abraham is really the covenant of God. Mm -hmm. That is, it was done at God's 
uh, behest, and not because of anything that Abraham had done. Yes. It's, it's really a covenant of grace. Yes. And sanctification is of grace. There are four cups on the Jewish Passover table. The cup of sanctification, the cup of thanksgiving, the cup of redemption, and the cup of completion. In Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, he says, I will bring you out, that's the first cup of sanctification, with Abraham. The second cup, the cup of thanksgiving, I will rid you out of their bondage. That's the exodus out of Egypt. The third cup of redemption, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. That's Calvary, the stretched out arms mm. of Jesus on the cross. But then comes this fourth cup, and I will take you unto me for a people. That's the second coming of Jesus mm. Christ, the cup of completion. Gary, a fascinating mm -hmm. set of cups here. Yeah, for the four cups literally outlined the history of the redeemed world in Abraham, Moses, and Christ, first and second coming. Of course, his first coming was when he came as the bread of life, offering the cup of his blood. And we remember that as, the, as we drink the communion cup. And it's amazing that when you drink the third cup, J.R., <clears throat> and I'm reading from a, a Jewish Passover Haggadah, uh, the third cup is accompanied by these words, Blessed is the man who trusts in Hashem, that is the Lord. Then the Lord will be his security. I was a youth and also have aged, and I have not seen a righteous man forsaken with his children begging for bread. The third cup is then, dr is then drunk. Uh, it's interesting that, that the bread is mentioned here. The redemption mm -hmm. cup is... Is the cup in which the bread is mentioned. Is, is, is the cup in which the bread is mentioned. It is not mentioned before. Not before. And Jesus, when He came the first time, offered His body as the bread of life. Uh -huh. Isn't that amazing? This third cup is, uh, is consumed, and then, J.R., something radically changes in, in the interval between the third and fourth cup. You ch change from God's grace to His wrath. Uh, these, these words come right after the pouring of the fourth cup. Pour your wrath upon the nations that do not recognize you and upon the kingdoms that do not invoke your name. That's when the fourth cup is poured. Mm. That's Armageddon. That's Armageddon. The tribulation period. Right. The second coming of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. The fourth cup. And all of the language then and the readings that precede the fourth cup, J.R., come out of the, the section of the Psalms called the Hallel. Uh -huh. And it's really amazing when you get into the Hallel, uh, the, the Psalms of Hallelujah uh, speak of the second coming of Christ and the defeat of the nations. And it begins with which Psalm? It begins with Psalm 116. Uh, I beg your pardon, Psalm 111. Psalm 111 Psalm, is the first one. And, and moving to Psalm 118. Because that follows Psalm 110. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Absolutely. Then begins the hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And all these hallelujahs. And in Psalm 116, <clears throat> we have the fourth cup even mentioned. Psalm 116, 13 says, I will take the cup of salvation, really in the Hebrew it's plural, salvations, and call upon the name of the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Those amazing. words are actually spoken just prior to drinking the fourth cup of Passover. The language here is that it's better to trust in God than it is to trust in man. In fact, the middle verse of the Bible occurs in Psalm 118, which is the final Hallel Psalm. And that, uh, that is verse uh, 8 of Psalm 118, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Now, this is the very theme of the fourth cup. In other words, without God, our cause is lost. Isn't that the middle verse of the Bible? Yes, it is. That would be the servant lamp then of this menorah. Huh? Absolutely. <laughs> it certainly would. <laughs> That's amazing. And so we have now the fourth cup, completion, really has two, two purposes. The Jews, when they teach about it, say that it, its teaching is specifically related to relationship. That is the relationship between God and His chosen people. And, and of course, that is one of its themes. But the other theme is the defeat of the nations which are gathered to destroy Israel. So it has two themes, this fourth cup. Mm. 
You know, I can't help but think of those Psalms because we have been following the Psalms that appear to be being fulfilled in this century. And uh, we cannot tell you that Psalm 100 will be fulfilled in the year 2000 because that's future. But it is interesting that after we get past this, this Melchizedek Psalm of 110, we get into those Hallelujah Psalms and this fourth cup mm -hmm. of completion. In other words, it's all going to be completed by then. Absolutely. The, the, uh, the completion has not come yet. Now, for us as individuals, <clears throat> that is individuals in Christ, uh, who remember the Lord's death till He come, when we take the communion, mm -hmm. uh, our relationship is absolutely secure. But in terms of national Israel and prophecy, the four cups are not fully played out yet. Beginning with Abraham, uh, God promised Abraham, I will make you the father of many nations and I will make your seed as the stars of heaven. And then he said, look to, to the north, south, east, and west and, and see the land I'm going to give you. And then he said, this land is yours. But you know what? That hasn't happened yet. You're right. It hasn't happened yet. Abraham never owned a square foot of it. That's right. Only the cave of Machpelah underneath it. And that's disputed, by the way. Isn't it, though? Yeah. The <laughs> Hebron is the site of a great deal of conflict these days. And uh, even uh, during the days of, um, let's say, Solomon and David, it mm -hmm. was not a permanent kingdom because they were soon going to be kicked out of it. That's and right. in the days following the first coming of Christ, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70. And uh, then under the Bar Kokhba revolt in 132 to 135 A.D., the Jews were scattered from their land and for the next 1,813 years, they were a people without a nation, without a king, without a priest, without a temple. In 1948, the, this baby was born again. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's moving toward a spiritual birth, isn't it? And the coming Absolutely. of Christ and the kingdom that will be set up. As the fourth cup is consumed, we, uh, we have this recitation given by the host of the Passover. And by the way, this is not new language. This is centuries, if not millennia old. It comes from the time of Christ where it says, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, for the vine, for the fruit of the vine, for the produce of the field, for the desirable, good, and spacious land that you were pleased to give our forefathers as a heritage, to eat of its fruit and to be satisfied with its goodness. Have mercy, we beg you, Lord our God on Israel and your people, on Jerusalem, your city, on Zion, resting place of your glory, your altar and your temple, rebuild Jerusalem, city of holiness, speedily in our days. That's yeah. an amazing yes. uh, request of God. And then you turn the page, the Passover Haggadah, and all the people say, next year in Jerusalem. That ends the, the taking the fourth cup. Now between the third and fourth cup, when the fourth cup is poured, the cup of Elijah is also poured. Mm -hmm. This cup of Elijah I think is fascinating because it deals with the completion it of the picture. Yeah, after the third cup is drunk and then the blessing of the fruit of the vine is given, the fourth cup is poured, passed out to everybody, mm -hmm. and Elijah's cup, which is usually a large ornate goblet, is, uh, is poured. And then they go to the front door and open it, come Elijah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see, this is why Malachi says, I will send you Elijah before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Elijah is one of the witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. These two witnesses will proclaim the second coming of Jesus Christ and prepare the Jewish people, the chosen people, for this fourth cup and final cup. Now, fascinating to me, Gary, the first cup was observed on a Passover, the self-same day. The That's second right. cup was observed on the 14th of Nisan. The third cup, the crucifixion of Christ, he was crucified on the 14th of Nisan. Question, will the fifth cup, uh, the, the fourth cup, pardon me, will the hmm. fourth cup, this cup of completion, will everything be completed on a Passover? Indeed, this is fascinating because when will Elijah come? We know he's coming before the great terrible day of the Lord. He's got to come on a Passover and set things in motion, J.R. Is that the Passover that begins <laughs> this process of completion? I think it is. Wow. Yeah. You know, with completion, we're talking about the, the paradise regained. We're talking about the Garden of Eden all over the world. Um, no more wild animals, uh, peace on earth at last. Uh, we're talking about resurrection and every disease being healed. It will be a great day, this fourth cup. 